welcome to lecture 1a of this course in this week completely we are focusing on a quick review of basic computer organization concepts that you have all learned this will also help those who are totally new to computer architecture background that with this week content they will be able to get the preliminary requirements to understand the rest of this course we will begin our discussion by having a quick understanding between what is the difference on computer architecture and computer organization when we talk about computer architecture this is the view of a computer to the software designers so we have a hardware and on top of that we have the operating system and then various application programs are running on top of this from an application designer point of view architectural features are those which are required for him to write a good program these are all basically your programmer needs the architectural details so architecture also talks about what to do for that we require the set of possible instructions that the programmer can give to the hardware such that he will be able to run this now how many different ways in which i can specify one operation that depends upon the addressing modes how can i define my data basically the different types of data types when you come to computer organization here we are talking about the actual implementation of a computer in a hardware there are various functional units it is about how these functional units are trying to interact between each other what are the micro architectural details of all these functional units how they work these are all implementational details which are transparent to a programmer so when a programmer looks at a machine the organizational features are not visible to him he wanted to perform for example a multiplication operation so he need to know how a multiplication operation is specified how i specify an operand and how the operation is all about but then he should not know about how the actual multiplication is carried out inside a computer so the process of implementation of a multiplication operation that is an organizational feature and what are the kind of addressing modes or what are the kind of instruction set that are been used in order to perform a multiplication that is an architectural feature so in short architecture specifies what all things can be done and organization specifies how these things are being implemented so in this course in the initial few lectures we will be focusing on the computer organizational aspect a quick review of that we will be doing it in today's lecture and as the course proceeds then we will be learning about advanced computer architectural features and moving on to multi core computer architecture now if you look at what is inside a computer system this is typically a motherboard that you can see the kind of boards that you even see in a laptop would be slightly different from what you see inside a typical computer system or a cpu now as marked here the most important component is this where you have the cpu that is going to be placed there the cpu ic is going to be placed and on top of that we have the fan and the heat sink and then this is the place where the memory of a computer is been kept the primary memory that is been connected there that is what is called the dram slots and then we have a north bridge and then we have a south bridge we have the accelerated graphics port and we have a peripheral controller interconnect that's pci and then various connectors that are used for io devices everything that is been kept this diagram may looks little clumsy but if you look at the broader block diagram we have a cpu and then there are two bridges the north bridge and the south bridge the north bridge connects the agp and pcie slots wherein the graphics card the core processors and other fast peripheral connection express are being directly linked as well as the memory slots so all high speed core processors and other devices that communicate with the cpu are connected through the north bridge and similarly we have the normal pcie slots which are the parallel port connections the hard disk the many other io devices everything is connected to the south bridge so north bridge is fast interface wherein high speed ic's are been connected whereas south bridge is a relatively slow interface to which the lesser fast devices are be connected now if you look into what are the broader functional units of a computer we know that a computer works with the help of a memory which we typically call it as a primary memory once the power is gone the contents of primary memory are no longer there they are lost whereas you have hard disk which is having a permanent storage and upon requirement we move the data from the hard disk into the main memory and when you are going to do a task 
then data is transferred from the memory into the computer's processor. So, this is typically your processor that you are going to work here and processor and memory will interact and how do you get the data? The data has been transferred from input devices like keyboard and mouse and the output can be visible in the output devices. These are all fundamental things that you have learned about a computer. Now, we know that when you work with a computer, its basic task is to execute programs. So, let us now study about or take a quick recap on how the execution of a program happens. It consists of various sub stages. So, what you see here is the execution cycle. So, first we will fetch an instruction. What do you mean by fetching? The instruction is typically stored in a memory and from the memory through the bus that connects between the memory and the processor, the instructions have to be moved. The process of moving an instruction from a memory to a processor through the bus that connects the memory and processor is known as an instruction fetch. So, in short, we obtain the instruction from the program storage. So, now your instruction is available inside the processor. So, what is the next step? The next step is about instruction decode. So, whatever you bring, they are bits, ones and zeros. It will represent some pattern. It can be an add operation or a move operation or a jump operation. So, whatever you have brought, we have to understand what this instruction is all about. Trying to understand an instruction, what a bit pattern represents, that is called instruction decoding. So, instruction decoding means to understand what are the required actions to be taken on this particular instruction. What this instruction is all about, where are its operands, where are its located and how big is the instruction. Some instructions are uh, of few bytes, some are of more number of bytes. So, depending upon the underlying instruction set architecture. So, in short, the first step is all about instruction fetch and then we decode the instruction. We perform operation to understand what an instruction is. And then we move to the third step which is called operand fetch. In the second step itself, we will identify what are the operands. Now, once you identify what are the operands, we have to locate them and bring those operands into the processor in order to carry out the task. And then we have to compute the operation or the status we have to perform. So, that is known as execution stage. Once the execution is over, whatever is the result that you got, it has to be saved either it in memory or it can be in some register itself. So, depositing the result in a storage for a later use that is known as the result storage. And then as far as one instruction is concerned, now its task is over. You bring the instruction, you decode it, you fetch the corresponding operands, execute it and store the result. Now, the next task is to find out which is the next instruction to be fetched, decoded and execution. So, the process of computation of the next instruction happens after that and then this cycle is being repeated. This is known as basic instruction execution cycle. So, here we have to understand in order to carry out a task, the task is represented as a program and the program consists of multiple instructions and these are saved inside your memory. The typical way in which a computer works is to carry out the execution of a program, we have to execute each of its instruction based upon the logic. And these instructions which are already stored in memory need to be transferred into the processor one by one and execute them. So, fetching, bringing the instruction, decoding, trying to understand what the instruction is, fetching the operands, bringing the corresponding data in order to carry out the instruction, after that executing, storing the result and then moving into the next instruction. Overall, this has been repeated and this basic steps constitute the instruction execution steps and this has been repeated. That is why it is known as instruction execution cycle. Now, if you look at the diagram that is represented, we have already seen what is the instruction execution cycle and in which the processor and memory are interacting. We know that inside processor we have an ALU which will perform the task and there is a control unit which will control the entire operations and there are some specific registers also. So, this diagram is uh, going to show about how processor and memory are interacting. Processor and memory are interacting through special wires that are connected between them. We have an address bus. So, any operation that you need to do in memory either bringing an instruction or bringing a data operand or storing a result, first I have to specify the address. 
So, from the processor, specify the address in the address bits accordingly one memory location is being chosen. If it is transfer to the processor that is from memory to the processor something like an instruction fetch. So, the instruction will flow like this. Suppose, the result of an operation need to be stored then it has to be moving from processor back into memory. In any way all these are being transferred through your data bus which is a bi-directional data bus. And then we have the control bus which will give necessary handshake signals and control signals needed for the memory in order to smoothly communicate with the processor. So, in short the address bus, the unidirectional address bus, the bi-directional data bus and the control bus facilitate an easy interface between the processor and memory in carrying out execution of instructions. And we know that we have a fetch operation and then we decode the operation and then you execute and this is the cycle in which this is being repeated. Continuing with the discussion on processor memory interaction, the processor consists of multiple registers which we call it as general purpose registers. These are temporarily used for carrying out operation, temporarily storing the values of operands and then there is an ALU, there is a control unit which exchange signals between processor and memory. And then there are two important registers, one is known as program counter which contains the address of the next instruction to be fetched and executed and there is an instruction register which will perform the decoding operation. Two important registers known as MAR and MDR, they act as the interface between the processor and the memory. The MAR stands for memory address register and MDR stands for memory data register. What you see on the right side of the slide is a bit more elaborated diagram of the internals of the processor. Like mentioned, we have a set of general purpose registers which will temporarily store your data and then there is an ALU wherein I can specify what is the operation that is to be carried out in the ALU. So, the control unit will give appropriate signals your arithmetic logic unit whether an add operation or a subtract operation or a logical operation whatever be the case it will be carried out there. And then you have two inputs for the ALU one will directly come from the bus and one will come through an internal register. So, A and B act as the input to the ALU. So, the control logic inside your processor has to make sure that one of the operand should reach A and the other operand should reach B of the ALU and then appropriate control signals are given. At the end of ALU operation the result is available in the set. If that has to be moved to any of the general purpose register it will enter into the system the central bus and it will go to any of the general purpose registers. Now, in short any operation that you wanted to do sometimes if the value is already available in a general purpose register first one of the operand has to be moved to y and then ultimately it will reach a by appropriately choosing of this multiplexer. The second operand will reach b. So, ultimately a and b will reach and then choose the control signal such that the result will be available in this set. So, that I can store it back into any of the general purpose registers. As mentioned how do processor gets this data from memory? it is through the memory bus that is being connected. So, we know that there is a data bus that is being connecting it is a bi-directional data bus and a unidirectional address bus. So, this address bus and data bus plus the control bus that is being here that is already been done these are helping in movement of data from memory into the processor. So, you have the program counter which will generate the address of the next instruction is to be fetched from the program counter it goes to MAR and MAR send out the address lines and through the address lines the value will reach the memory that is being shown here the value will reach memory and the contents will come back into the processor through MDR memory data register and then it is being moved to IR the instruction register. So, once it is there in the instruction register the decode logic will try to understand what the instruction is and then accordingly necessary control signals are being generated in order to carry out the operation. Now, let us see various registers inside the CPU. The first one is memory address register that you can see and then we have the second one is memory data register. So, these two registers are going to directly interface with the memory which has been already given the random access memory your main memory. So, the address bus starts from 
memory address register to the memory. So, whenever you wanted to perform any operation in memory, be it a read or write or fetching of an instruction, MAR should contain the address of the location and MDR act as the point of interface. Anything that is to be moved to memory or that is coming from memory, that is why we can see it as a bidirectional bus that is there, that is your data bus that is going to connect to MDR. So, any movement of data that is happening with memory, MDR is a point of interface. So, if it is a read operation, once you specify the address in MAR, the contents of the location will travel through data bus and it will reach MDR. Similarly, if it is a write operation, first you have to keep the data to be written in memory in MDR and then upon giving the corresponding address in MAR, contents from MDR will be moving to the RAM. So, these are two important registers, they are facilitating the primary interface with respect to the memory. Now, we move and see what are the other registers. The next important one is the program counter as mentioned it contains the address of the next instruction to be fetched and then we have instruction register which is directly connected to the control unit and the decoding of instruction happen in instruction register and then there is an arithmetic logic unit which performs all arithmetic and logical operations. So, any arithmetic or logic operation that you need to do, the corresponding operand need to reach the input of ALU which we discussed in the previous slide and the output is generated which can be taken back to any of the registers and then primarily the output will come in the accumulator it is also known as a work register and then the whole operations are controlled by a system clock. So, we have already seen what is there inside a processor which are facilitating an interface with memory and the execution of an instruction. Now, let us see what is the internals of a fetch, decode and execution of an instruction and during the execution of this instruction, what are the various signals that are being exchanged and how these registers are going to cooperate each other, they synchronize each other in order to get the task done. Let us first start with the fetching operation, like mentioned the first and foremost operation associated with the execution of an instruction is to fetch the instruction from the memory into the processor. So, like we know that program counter contains the address of the instruction to be fetched. So, step number 1 is the address of the next instruction to be transferred which is already available in the program counter has to be moved to MAR memory address register that is step number 1. So, you can see that from here it will go into MAR through the internal bus. With this what happens is from MAR the address bus starts. So, the address will flow through the address bus and one location inside your memory is being chosen. So, the target the instruction is located in the memory. Now, if you go the next step is from there from the corresponding location that is being chosen by MAR in the memory the instruction will come to MDR, the instruction is copied from the memory to this is copied from memory to MDR. Now, the next step is whatever is the instruction that is currently available in MDR that is moved to the IR for decoding operation that is step number 4 and in step number 5 the IR the contents of IR that is basically your instruction, this is decoded and then necessary control signals has to be generated. So, the control unit sends signals to the appropriate devices to cause the execution. Sometimes it may be giving some signals to ALU if it is an add operation, then the corresponding operand has to reach the input of ALU and once you give the add control signal, adding operation happens inside ALU and the result is going to be stored. So, you have a PC to MAR movement and from MAR the corresponding location is chosen in RAM, then that contents of the memory is been moved to MDR, from MDR it goes to IR for decoding, after decoding the control unit generates necessary signals such that appropriate unit will perform this operation. For all the discussion that we had, we know that the interaction between the processor and the memory is very important. Now, we will see little more detail about 
how the internals of this memory works once the processor gives an address. We have already seen that MAR and MDR are the two interfacing registers where the processor is interfacing with the memory. And what you see on the right side is once the memory address register generates the address, you have your address bus and through the address bus these ones and zeros the addresses will flow from MAR into the memory and the memory has an address decoder. So, if there are n bits in the address that is been coming from memory address register the decoder will be of the configuration n is to 2 power n. So, that means it is an n input decoder where you have 2 power n output lines. So, depending on what is the n bit that is been coming one of the 2 power n output line is been selected and accordingly one of the memory location is also been chosen. So, once I give a value in MAR this values will flow through the address bus into the address decoder and address decoder will uniquely select one of its output line which will select one location in memory whose contents are then transferred through memory data register through the data bus. Now, consider this example how memory works to start with consider the case that we have a memory that is having only 4 locations. So, then I have to specify an address let us say my address is 0 0 2 bits in the address a 0 and a 1 0 0 then d 0 will be selected. If the value is 0 1 0 1 means your a 0 is 1 then d 1 is chosen if the value is 1 1 then d 2 is sorry if the value is 1 0 then d 2 is chosen if the value is 1 1 then d 3 is also chosen. So, 2 bits in the address will choose one among the four locations. Similarly, this is a case where I have three bits in the address it will choose it will choose one among the eight locations. So, that is why it is a 3 is to 8 decoder that is been used. So, if the values are completely zeros then this is been chosen if the value is 1 1 0 then this is been chosen if it is 1 1 1 then the last one is been chosen. So, the role of the address decoder is based upon the input address one of the memory location is been uniquely selected and its contents are now transferred into the data bus if it is a read operation. What if it is a write operation based upon the location whatever is the data that is coming through the data bus will go into the memory location and the location is getting updated. So, your MAR is contacting the address decoder and the data bus is connected to the memory data register the MDR. Now, think of a case that I have certain memory which is of some definite size and my requirement of total memory is much bigger than that. So, in that case how do you choose? Imagine a case that you require an 8k memory, 8 kilobytes of memory wherein only 1 kilobytes of memory units are available we call it as memory IC. So, a bigger 8 kilobyte of memory has to be realized using 1 kilobyte memory units. So, I am going to give an example by which how this kind of a larger memory design can be accomplished by making use of smaller memory components. So, all these are what you have you have 8 1 k into 8 1 k means 1 k rows are there 1024 rows and each row can store 8 bit of information. So, it is basically 1 k b. So, 8 such 1 k b units are kept here that is what you see memory 0 chip which has a 1 k b memory 1 chip is another like that it is there. Now, when you have 8 k b then that that is basically corresponding to 2 power 13 bytes it means there are 13 bits in the address. Now, the 13 bit in the address it starts with A 12 onwards. So, your A 9 to A 0 that will be going into each of this memory and these 3 bits the higher order 3 bits are used in chip selection logic this is a 3 is to 8 line decoder. So, 3 bits are there based on these 3 bit value one of the 8 output line is activated and accordingly only one memory chip would be chosen 
and the remaining 10 bits even though it is going to all of them since only one chip select logic works this 10 bits will uniquely identify one byte within that one kb available in that so what we have is we have a12 a11 and a10 and then we have a9 to a0 these three bits are being fed to a 3 is to 8 decoder and that is used for chip select logic we have total of 8 chips of 1 kb now this chip selection happens with the help of these 3 bits and the remaining 10 bits will choose 1 byte out of 1024 byte that is been available so altogether the 13 bits of your address is used for uniquely choosing one byte of 8 kilobytes the most significant 3 bits are used for selection of the chip and the least significant 10 bits are used for choosing a byte within the selected chip in this way larger memory can be realized the same can be used if you are going for a 32 kb or 1 mb with the smaller components so the lower bits in the address will be used to index into the memory location inside a chip and the higher bits are used basically for selection of the chip now let me move into the next concept which is known as byte ordering we have seen that in the previous slide your memory consists of a sequence of bytes so your linear memory consists of sequence of bytes now your word whatever data that you wanted to write may not be always in terms of granularity of bytes let us say my word is consisting of 32 bits or 4 bytes now these 4 bytes which constitute my single word has to be stored inside a memory so when you store in memory it has to be stored sequentially based upon what is the order in which these 4 bytes are being stored inside a memory we have two formats one is known as the little ndn format the other one is known as big ndn format so certain processors follow little ndn format and some other processors follow big ndn format we will try to see the difference between them with the help of an illustration example so coming into this byte ordering as mentioned we have big ndn and little ndn now imagine the case that we are going to have a value like this this is written in the hexadecimal form so each of them will represent so 1 2 is hexadecimal 1 2 like that a b 3 4 c d totally we have now 32 bits of data or total 4 bytes of data i have now this 1 2 is the most significant byte so when you follow a big ndn thing and then we are going to store these 4 bytes in memory so this will be 4 continuous bytes the most significant byte would be stored in the lower address so we are now going to store in 4 consecutive address bytes which are w w plus 1 w plus 2 and w plus 3 wherein your 12 will be stored in w a b the next significant byte will be stored in w plus 1 the next one will be stored in w plus 2 and the least significant byte will be stored in w plus 3 so in short the most significant byte of a word would be stored in the lower address and the least significant byte of a word will be stored in the higher address okay so if it is 4 byte the msb most significant byte will be stored in lower address and the least significant byte will be stored in the higher address if it is 4 byte let it be location m and this would be m plus 3 now let us see what happens in the little ndn format it is just the reverse of that of that in the little ndn format so what we have here is the little ndn format where what you do suppose if a value is already stored like this when you are being read this value is been read by a little ndn processor and then let us say these are the 4 bytes that constitute whatever is in w that will be going into the lsb and whatever is in cd that is going into msb so think of a case how do you store 
So, in a little endian format, let us say this is my data, look at another example to get it more clarified. The data that I need to write into memory is 0 a, 0 b, 0 c and 0 d in hexadecimal format. Now, you know that it is a little endian format. In little endian, the LSB goes to the lower address. So, the LSB 0 d that goes to location a, address a. 0 c goes to a plus 1, 0 b go to a plus 2 and 0 a go to a plus 3. But if the same data is operated on a big endian processor, then what happens? Your MSB 0 a will go to a, 0 b will go to a plus 1, 0 c will go to a plus 2 and 0 d will go to a plus 3. That is the difference between a big endian and little endian. So, in the same 4 bytes when it comes to a little endian, the MSB will go to the higher address and the LSB will go to the lower address. So, LSB would be m and MSB would be in m plus 3. Similarly, it can be 4 bytes or 8 bytes or 16 bytes as the case may be. Always understand that when you talk about a big Indian, then the most significant byte of a multi byte word that will go to the lowermost address out of the sequence. Let us say I am storing in a sequence of address starting from m, m plus 1, m plus 2 like that. If it is a big endian processor, the MSB will go to M. The next significant byte will go to M plus 1. Like that, the least significant byte will go to the highest address. In a little endian format, the MSB will go to the highest possible address. So, here the least significant byte will go to location M. The next significant byte will go to M plus 1 like that. So, this is the two different kind of a formats. Certain processors are following big endian format, whereas certain other processors are following a little endian format. So, think of a case into your memory processor 1 which follows a big endian format write some data and processor 2 is going to read the data, but if processor 2 is following a little endian format, the data that it receives is totally different one. Now, let us talk about byte or word alignment. Look at the diagram here if it is aligned, if your memory is aligned to one byte, so at any byte I can start a data. Here you have a one byte data, this green is a two byte data. So, any data can start at the beginning of any byte, there is no restriction that has been assigned. You will be able to see the difference once I talk about aligned to two bytes. Aligned to two bytes means any new data that you store in memory can only start at bytes which are even number 0, 2, 4, 6 like that. So, consider the case that you store a first a single byte data. So, if you write like this, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 like this. The next data, even though this portion is empty, I will not start there. I will start only at 2 because of the alignment, because I align to 2 bytes. But my second data is actually 2 bytes. So, byte number 2 and byte number 3, the second data will spread on. The third data, even if it is single byte, I can start on 4. Let us say I have one more new data, which is a one byte. I cannot make use of this, because I can start the new data only here. So, this will be occupying in this portion. Similarly, the next one byte will be coming like this. So, these will be wasted, because I wanted to keep my memory aligned to two bytes. Similarly, if, if my memory is aligned to four bytes, then data can start only at intervals of four bytes. So, even if it is a one byte data, the next byte cannot be occupying this because they are not multiples of 4. So, this is the place where a new data starts at 4, this is empty, this is 8. Now, if I have a 4 byte data, it can start only at 12 and it goes from 12 to 15. So, this is called memory or word alignment. Sometimes keeping your memory aligned is also important because then we know that when a new data type starts, it cannot arbitrarily start on any byte. So, that we will always read from the beginning of a data. If memory is not aligned, your da new data can start at any location. Then we need to know what was the previous data. If the previous data is single byte, then accordingly the new data beginning also will vary. If the previous data is two byte, the new data varying will start. So, if the memory is already aligned, let us say it is aligned to four bytes, then we understand that anything that starts with 0, with 4, with 8, with 12, these are the possible points in which a data can start. Data will never start at 11, data will never start at 7 with 5. This will help us to process and read the data 
without any error. This slide also gives you an example of the alignment. The first row is talking about these are all the bytes. So, if I am going for one byte alignment, then my data can be starting at any point. If it is a two byte kind of an alignment, then this is the alignment portion. 0 and 1 will occupy another one data, 2 and 3 is another. So, you can see that at 4 it starts, at 6 it starts. But if my data, even though it is a 2 bytes, but if I start at 1, this is misaligned. Even though the actual length is 2 bytes, I cannot start it at 1. If I start it 1, then I tell that the memory is misaligned. Similarly, for 4 bytes, it has to start at 0, 4 like that. Any 4 byte data that is starting at 1 and ending at 5, it is misaligned. Something starting at 5 and ending at 9, that is also misaligned. So, if my memory is 4 byte aligned, if it is starting at 2 also, it is not acceptable. 2 and 6 not acceptable. 3 and 7 also, it is not acceptable. Similarly, when it comes to 8, it has to either start at 0, then it has to start at 8. Anything that is starting other than multiples of 8 like 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5, 6, 7, these all are considered to be misaligned. So, here if it is 8 byte, then this is the alignment. If it is 4 byte, this is the alignment. If it is 2 byte, this is the alignment and if it is 1 byte, this is the alignment. So, in this way, we are able to see that which are all are aligned and which are all are not aligned. <coughs> So, with this we come to the end of uh, the lecture 1a, just a quick recap of what we learnt. We started with the concept of what is the difference between computer architecture and computer organization and then we understood the program execution cycle. We were learning about what is fetching, decoding, execution, storing of the result and then how to compute the next instruction and then we learnt about what are the important registers that are been involved in the basic execution of an instruction from MAR, from MDR, program counter, instruction register, your ALU, your accumulator and the clock that carries the control over everything in terms of timings. And then we slowly moved into how instruction execution happens by making use of some examples. And then we learned about the interfacing between the processor and the memory and what is the role that MAR and MDR is playing. We learned about three different types of bus, the address bus which is unidirectional, the data bus which is bidirectional and the control bus that is also bidirectional. We learned about how memory interfacing happens, what is the role of memory decoder and towards the end we see that how larger memory can be designed with the help of smaller memories. Smaller memories can be fit in together and accordingly the few bits in the address can be used for chip select, the remaining bits in the address is used for selection of the byte within that. Then we learned about byte ordering, the big endian and little endian format and then the memory alignment. In the subsequent class, we will learn little bit of uh, few more concepts in the fundamentals of computer organization before we try to understand advanced and multi-core computer architectures. Feel free to go through the assignments and if there are any queries, please do write us. We would be happy to help you. Enjoy learning. Thank you.